Okay. Uh, let's see. Aside from our folks here, we have Matt and Kether. All right. Matt and Kether, Tony and Heather. And they're all Sharon. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> I'm going to have to see if I can't rig this class one, one day where we can't. Uh, I've actually got something in mind, but I mean, maybe even permanently do something where we can hear from them at certain times and stuff like that. Matt and Heather, Tony and Heather, all sharing. All right, turn with me to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1. <clears throat> and if it feels like we're not making any progress, you'd be really wrong. You definitely would be wrong. Because I have... Um, I heard from the Lord this time how to approach this class, and I believe that we're right on track. Uh, and this will be our, I think this will be our third pass through 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 3. And so, Lord, be merciful to me, a repeater. But what we're going to do tonight in tonight's repeating is we're going to get a little more, um, while there will be many repeats, <clears throat> we're going to get a little more specific. More specific in relationship to <clears throat> discovering God's power in terms of weakness, God's wisdom in terms of foolishness, <clears throat> and Lord willing, tonight, sometime, We'll get into some excellent examples from the Word of God. <clears throat> um, but, uh, and, then that, and then this pass, whether it's one class, two classes tonight, or two more next time we meet, um, as I said, we'll get more into r some real specifics. And then we will have one more pass after that, and that one is going to be like an overview where we can take in the full scope of what it is that we've shared up to this point. And by having that going into the next phase after this, which will not after that fourth pass, I believe it will help us and I believe it will prepare us for... Uh, some of the specific things that God wants, that God wants, and I believe that, that God wants us to um, hear, not from me, but from his heart. And I believe that my work is to just lay the groundwork. I also believe that my place <clears throat> is primarily to be a student myself, and I am, <clears throat> and that I need this <clears throat> every bit as much as anyone else needs it <clears throat> the way I'm feeling more, and that's, that's a fact. I want to know the Lord. I want to know the Lord. I want to not just have my own perceptions or the perceptions of someone else, just as you, even as you should not, as should want your own perceptions of the Lord by the Lord and not as by me. Um, the purpose of classes, the purpose of teaching is not to have us all thinking alike bunch of clones. The purpose on my part is I gain a lot by just saying it. <laughs> you know, it's like really, really helps me. 
Okay. The purpose for you is for you to listen to the Holy Spirit and find out what he's saying to you, not what I'm saying to the class. And many times that may be something completely the opposite, or not opposite in teaching, but in a completely different direction than what I'm sharing. And if it is completely opposite in teaching of what I'm saying and it's from the Lord, that's where you want to go anyway, isn't it? <laughs> So, <clears throat> so in a humble heart, I approach these, these sharings again for this third time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, For the preaching of the cross, and remember the, the actual Greek there, there I said it, Mallory, the actual Greek is the word of the cross. This is the word of the cross. And you, you have your Greek book there, don't you? Good, good for you because I may be deferring to you a couple of times in this class tonight. The word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> And then he begins to talk about this wisdom and this power that, uh, for example, in verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Gentiles foolishness. But unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For the most part, when people approach the subject of <clears throat> power, uh, they tend to think in terms of, particularly in this country, we a lot of people tend to think in terms of supernatural power, <clears throat> things such as miracles or healings or deliverances uh, <clears throat> or the, you know, the mighty power of God to deliver them from a mean boss. Um, <laughs> I... I <laughs> troubling situation. I need the power of God. I need the mighty power of God because I have an ingrown toenail or something, you know, you understand what I'm saying. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of that, but I am saying the mighty power of God should do more than just fix temporary things. We also tend to think of it in terms of that power of God, you know, I'm just, you know, don't mess with me. I'm a child of God. And if you do something to me, God will exact justice on you. Anybody ever sort of felt that way at any time in your walk? You know, that, you know, I mean, it's, I did, and, and, um, and it's, it's like, there is a, you know, there is a power of God. And if you mess with God's children, you mess with God's people, you're going to be in trouble. Greg? Oh, Yeah. Well, I just want to say that one of my best girlfriends in the whole world just walked into the room, Grace Kashatka. Hi, sweet girl. <laughs> All right. So, um, and you know, that, that exacting of justice is not just a personal thing, but um, can be looked at like, well, if you're 
if you're persecuting me or you're persecuting my nation. And I don't want to go into it too much. I'll just make a statement that, that, that much of our Christianity is tied up in this country. Much of our Christianity in this country is tied up to our nation. It is. Very strongly. Because our father, our forefathers, you know, <clears throat> were all Christian is basically the way we say it. You know, our foreflushers were all, I mean, forefathers were all Christians. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, this isn't the Holy Land. And I got news for you. Neither is Israel. You know, I, I knew that. I know that from certain things. But I guarantee you, I've, I've heard it from people who have been missionaries there. And it's rank over there. Way worse than many, many nations. The only thing that made it holy was Jesus was there. And yes, David was there, and Abraham was there, and Moses was there, and yet the only thing that made them holy was Jesus. I mean, if you just get real. All right, that's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> um, I will say this. We got, we got horrible people in this country. We got people that are sucking the, the finances out of the poor just to get rich. They're sucking the resources out of the ground, causing earthquakes just to get rich. On and, on and on and on and on and on and on. And it is just ridiculous where we're headed. However, <clears throat> me and you and whoever else out there that we don't know, there, you know, there are those who have their focus on the Lord. And that's ultimately all that matters because if you are in Son and you are with Christ in, his, in oneness, then he treats you as his son because it is his son. Now there's growth in that that we must grow up in and all that stuff. But, um, and, but that doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect. God will protect you in every way, and you won't face any persecution on the job or as a nation or anything else. It's ridiculous. You will. All right, so, so we're talking about power. And so in, just in a, in a general way, <clears throat> most people's comprehension of, of, of power involves uh, the ability to be in charge, that's power, you know, whether that's by force or by uh, some sort of influence, we call manipulation, but some, you know, uh, pressing your influence, you know. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> that's what we call power. If you're in charge, you have power. That means that if you're not in charge, you have no power. Okay. Well, I mean, if you think about it, there are a whole lot of people on jobs and in business or in families or whatever that are not in charge. That means that the only person, if that's the, the right thinking, the only person that has any power at all is the person who's the boss. And that's not true. To me, the supreme example that being in charge doesn't mean you have power was when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. And he was trying to get Jesus to stand up for himself. My God, speak up. Stand up for yourself. Be a man. I don't know what, you know, but you know, come on. Say something on your behalf because everybody else is talking against you. And so finally he says, look, you know, don't you know, this is Pontius Pilate talking to Jesus, don't you know that I have power? And his, his wordings specifically were, I have power to put you to death, have you put to death? Or to let you go, basically. And Jesus said, you have no power at all except it be given you of my Father. I don't care who you are or what, what your position is or what your title is. 
You don't. And I learned that after becoming a pastor. You don't really have much power. You know? I mean, you could, you could, if you wanted to, by force or by influence, keep funneling people a certain way while it's not in them to be that way. It's not in them to give, but I will share in such a manner that brings guilt to people that causes them to really give. Anybody ever heard of that happening before? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, to uh, make sure that you attend all the services and stuff and uh, make sure that you're helping in this area or in that area and to you know I I was faced with if if I don't do this nothing's gonna get done And I came to the conclusion I'd rather nothing get done by the flesh or by me manipulating people to do stuff that isn't God in them. Thank you for that, amen. I would rather not get anything done. And for, there, there was a, we got a lot of people here that were, have been here for a long time, so some of y'all remember periods of time where nothing got done. <laughs> We just, we just, you know, I mean, if it wasn't the Lord, we're not going to do it. And if it's not in somebody, we're not going to do it. I mean, I remember, I remember when the, uh, the, uh, uh, when George was running the shelter for the men, the homeless shelter, running the homeless shelter, and he. He really had the Lord in that. I mean, he really, it was in his heart to do that. And it was just incredible how well he did it with almost no supervision. The supervision was only, whatever supervision was there was to support him in the spirit in which he was carrying it and just to make sure that he knew he was supported and that we cared and you know but he just had the spirit of the thing and I remember when he died well guess what else died well first with the heart for the mission because nobody had that in them but George and when George died somebody came to me and said well who are we going to put in charge now <laughs> and uh, and I just said, well, you know, I guess we'll just have to see if the Lord raises someone else up who has that kind of heart, because how do you replace that? And, and the truth is, you don't replace it. You just have to have somebody else raised up of God, and they're not a replacement. They're the new that God is going to do in that place, and they're probably going to do it completely different, but for God. And you have to trust that, and you have to believe that, and you have, to, you have to know that God is in control. But we waited, and we waited, and we waited, didn't we, folks? And we wanted to see something happen. It was, it was really cool what was going on down there, and there were a bunch of guys that got saved. And guess what? We're still waiting. <laughs> and I don't know why Mike hadn't known the Lord was moving on him all this time, but then... <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, um, the the so the, so power power is seen in a completely different light than the way God sees power. We we for example, all these candidates running for president right now, we're looking for the one that's going to make something happen and use the power of the office to make it happen. Okay, well that sounds real good in that light, doesn't it? But really what is behind that too? I mean, what spirit is behind that? I mean, I'll, you know, I'll just, you know, since uh, I don't think we put the, 
the time or the dates on these things, so most people watching this aren't going to know who's president right now. But I remember who was running for president, who is president right now, and his platform had nothing to do with politics. I remember it absolutely clearly. It was all on, you're all going to get rich and have nice homes and get good jobs and all this stuff. Well, pfft. You know, and I'm not, I'm not mocking him at all or, or any president, but I'm saying, you know, to, to try to get an office by messing with people's greed or messing with people's self, that self says, I, I want that. Ultimately, in, in God's reckoning, is not going to work out. I don't care how good you are. Okay, I guess I'm probably saying a lot of stuff getting me in trouble tonight, but <clears throat> we're talking about power. And you've got to remember that in light of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter here where he's contrasting the power of this world versus the power of God, the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God in weakness, <clears throat> the, the prevailing image of that time period of what power was, was the Roman Empire. It was the Roman Empire. And that's where they found their definition. And the Roman Empire was incredibly powerful and incredibly efficient in, in the ways that they went at things. And they, were, they would uh, literally march out in vast numbers with incredible inventions of weapons and they would enslave nations to the will of Rome. Yeah. Enslave nations to the will of Rome and they, they would defeat their enemies just literally by pounding them into submission. I mean, that's Rome. You know, okay, well, I'll get you to agree with me. Bam, bam, bam. You know? We say, well, I don't do that. I manipulate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they would oppress those who were already subjected, who had already been pounded into submission. They would oppress those uh, by means of forcing tribute on them so that they were always working and they were always trying to have enough for themselves but pay off the tribute that was required. All right. So basically all the people are living in fear or if you're a general in the army of the Roman Empire, you're living pretty good. Nothing, nothing in that image of power has one inkling to do with the kingdom of God. Not one. That brave heart image. And so, um, and, and Another thing that we don't realize is that within that system, you know, how they governed everything and whatever, you know, they, they looked pretty good because they sort of looked in their government like they had a parliament, like they had all these delegates that came. Did you know that? I mean, and it looked sort of democratic. <laughs> you know, well, it was good for the delegates because it was based on sort of a caste system. What's, what's, another, what's a better word for caste system? Some of you know. Uh, class, 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 distinctions. class distinctions. And that was, that was a huge, huge part of who wielded power in the Roman Empire because that all had to do with do you have money or do you have influence or can you pull strings, you know what I mean, and can you do this and that. And all of that having to do, again, with who is honored and who is not honored. And, and back then, the, the, the weak 
and the working class, they were just nobodies. And they were, well, you know what they really were? They were backs upon which the Roman Empire could be built. They were backs upon which that whole thing was built. <clears throat> and so that was the, you know, that was the uh, picture of power that they had. And any nation that they came into and just rolled over, they just said, these people are weak. And any people that didn't even stand and fight, they said, these people are rejects. We are the world power. Okay. Well, you know, just for interest's sake, right now, the United States is the world power. Did you know that? You know, I mean, there was one time it was questionable between the United States and Russia, but right now, this minute, it's slipping away quickly. <laughs> and there's another world power emerging to the ignorance of most people and really may be there now. It's just that nobody wants to accept that. Um, well, you know, this was the kind of situation that Paul wets his pen in the ink and he starts to write concerning the power of God is the cross. We preach Christ, the Son of God, the power of God. No, he didn't say I preach Christ, the Son of God. Bring forth my Son. We preach Christ crucified. The wisdom and the power of God. And the contrast of that was to immediately, if you embrace that, you would immediately put yourself in a lower caste no matter where you were on the ladder. You would be seen as foolish. Your way would be seen as foolish and your wisdom would just be what kind of sissy stuff is this? You know? And so, you know, they, uh, I wrote down, the world had a variety of ways of wielding power. There is the power brought about by influence. There is the power had by being in control. In control in control. Folks, there are a lot of people that try to be in control of whatever they can. Now, you know, if you take, for example, Hitler, he was in control of Nazi Germany, okay? But that wasn't enough for him. Well, it wasn't, you know? Um, and he said, well, you know, I think I kind of like, you know, Poland or Austria first, Austria, I think, you know, and then, you know, Poland and then, well, then France and then, you know, a little more. There was a running joke back in the late 50s of, of uh, Khrushchev sitting there with all the other countries at the United Nations and it came time to order a meal, and they said, well, well, what will you have, you know, Mr. So-and-so from India? Well, I'll have this. And what will you have uh, from France, president from France? Well, I'll have this. And they said, well, Mr. Khrushchev, what will you have? And he said, oh, don't order for me. I'll have some of everybody else's. <laughs> well, That's the way it is in people all the time. Here's the problem. They don't have the resources Hitler had to go take it. But if they did, and most people take as much as they can, and even if it's just over 
you know, their husband and kids or wife and kids or, you understand what I mean, their, their job because they're the boss on their job. Uh, you, you following me here? You know. They want to maintain control and they do that by power or manipulation. You know, uh, men can be cruel and forceful and threatening. Women can just start crying and you go, the guy will go, what? You know, don't cry, I'll give you what you want. I tell Deb, don't cry, I'll give you a napkin. Kleenex. <laughs> Not that bad. But there is this wielding of power. What did I say? The, there's a power had by being in control. There is a power of force by an iron will backed by the resources to enforce that will, that will. Because that's really what those resources are. They are used to enforce that will. My will is this. And you see, there are people who want their way. And they would, they would destroy anybody to get their way. The problem is they don't have any weapons. They don't have any resources. Do you understand? They don't have any... Uh, they don't have a lot of finances or they don't have a, a large enough voice or something. So they're never much of a threat, but they could actually be, and this is tough for some people to realize, but they could actually be the same equivalent as Hitler. They just were never given the resources to do that. So they, they have a very small kingdom, me in my bedroom or something, you know what I mean? It's a... You know, don't move that. You know, that's my nightstand. Did you have a comment? I just, and that emphasis causes bitterness. Would you like to uh, expand on that? Expand on that? Sure. Uh, someone who seeks control over things but finds the impotence to do such a thing uh, stirs up a root of bitterness, which can come from any number of unforgiveness. But wanting things to be your way and not having them your way and, and not being able to do anything about it when ungoverned, you know, will grow very quickly and, and will create a, an entire view of a person that is just bitter and hateful of everything because they can't control everything. And it just feeds on itself until they're unhappy and miserable about everything around them. And, uh, Right. Well, and that's... So the only way they can get happy is to find someone they can control. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, folks, what, what, what I'm trying to show you here is this is everyone's government except Christ and those who are joined in nature to Christ who have, have embraced, folks, not Jesus as Savior, but who have embraced Christ crucified. In, in the manner of which Paul's talking here. Because you look at it. He's talking about Christ crucified, and he hadn't mentioned the forgiveness of sins once. He hadn't mentioned not going to hell once. He hadn't mentioned the cross in light of Jesus um, um, taking away your punishment at all. Rather, he's presenting what he calls the, I'm going to call it this way, the way of God in terms of wisdom and power before there was a sinner, before there was a need in that way. Okay, is that, does that kind of help clarify that? Because that's not the subject. I mean, you can read it and you can go over the first chapter and you can go over the second chapter and you can go over the third chapter and really on and on and on for a good while. And he, does, he never mentions those things, but he mentions the cross. And, and if you don't catch it, and I'm just saying this, that's one reason why we keep having these passes through chapter 1, 2, and 3. Because if you don't fully catch it, you're not going to understand 4, or 5, or 6, or 7, or 8, or 9, or 10, or 11, or 12, or 13, or 14. And maybe you can pull off 
a lot of stuff out of paper towels. <laughs> so, do you see why? We have to linger over these things. We must linger over them because if we don't really see this, then what we do is we take all this as some sort of a doctrine or we take this as some sort of a teaching, you know, about uh, Jesus died on the cross for us. And we never are confronted with our own way of thinking, man's wisdom. You understand? Our own way of uh, getting the victory, force or manipulation, <laughs> you know. Um, and you know as well as I know. I mean, I know this stuff. I, you know, I know that I know stuff doctrinally from searching the word and God even teaching me. You know, God can actually show you doctrines in the Bible and you not have the spirit of that. Well, I don't want that. Because isn't that really what a Pharisee is? <laughs> he knows the Bible, but he doesn't know Jesus. He, doesn't know, he, he knows scripture, but he doesn't know the living word. You know? And so, you know... I have to continually catch myself, and the truth is you never catch yourself because you never will. The Holy Spirit has to do that, but you do have to yield to that. It, you know, it is a still, small voice, and he kind of does this to me, you know, and when he nudges me, I have learned not to, you know, I'm learning not to shove that off, but to uh, say, okay. I'm sure that I don't have a clue what that was about. That little nudge. But you do. And I, you know, I know that you're doing that in response to my prayer and the belief that my heart, I really do want the Lord. So talk to me. It's never fun when he does. I, I mean, when, when he does that, when he does the nudge thing. It's never fun because he's going to show me something I didn't know that I thought I was okay in, and I never want to know that I'm not okay. I always want to think I'm Mr. Wonderful, uh, and I'm not. He's, <laughs> he's <laughs> you know, I've, I've got nudge bruises all over my body, <laughs> enough to prove that I am not Mr. Wonderful, okay? <laughs> that I'm in desperate, desperate need of the Holy Spirit who will impart the spirit of truth and who will open the eyes of my understanding to the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. <clears throat> all right. So ultimately, he's not trying to reveal what's wrong with us. Why did I say that? What, what anybody, can anybody tell me why I just said that? In fact, can anybody actually tell me what I just said? Okay, good. Now, how many can tell me why I said that? Nisi? Conscious of ourselves and what needs to be fixed, and we, we, because of the fall, are consumed with us, not him. Right. Okay. There's there can be a little more expanding on that. Somebody else, Mike. Well, because he's the answer, we can get wrapped up in trying to fix ourselves on our lives, and nothing changes. Yeah. Well but said. He's the answer. That's that's well said because. We really think the issue with God is to straighten us out. And that's and I don't care how many times I've heard <laughs> that this is about Jesus. <laughs> Until I know this is about Jesus, you know what I'm saying. When I'm, I, you know, not heard it over and over and can say it to people that they think I'm spiritual. But until I know this is about Jesus, I don't mind him nudging me because he's not really trying to fix me. It's not about me, but he has to use me. I am the great contrast. 
of Christ. I am the great contrast of Christ. You know, he is the great I am. I am the great contrast of him who is the great I am. And so he's not really fixing me on those fronts. He's replacing me. And he does that how? First of all, by the cross. There is no true replacement without the cross. There's only an adjustment on our part. So there has to be this Christ crucified thing and there has to be this reality of the cross. But the, the cross, I mean, let, let, using, I'm trying to use terminology in the proper order of the way the Holy Spirit's talking to me now. Okay, So the cross is for me. Okay, we, I think we all know that, right? Let me just write the cross here. The cross, that is for me. To what end? Pardon? The end. Yeah, to what end? The end. So that I, might, that I might die. That there might actually be a death so that he that glorieth doesn't glory at all <laughs> unless it is in the Lord. Because there's a death. Okay, but... On the other side of that death that I died is Christ crucified. Good. Good for y'all. Good for y'all. Praise God. Because Christ crucified is a life of self-giving. A life of selflessness. Okay? And that can't, let's, let's just be honest here right now. That can't be until I'm dead. If my cup is full, he can't, you know, if it's full of bitter coffee, he can't pull, pour sweet tea into it. And, Jim, do you hate bitter coffee? <laughs> well, if you hate bitter coffee, I know, I know your answer to that is sweet coffee. <laughs> You see, you see the theology that's wrong in that? It's, st it's the same thing. It's just gotten sweeter. <laughs> the answer is Christ. The answer is a replacement. And there cannot be Christ crucified without the cross. And the cross confronts us not with our problems, but with our living. With the fact that we're living. Christ crucified is a contrast to us to show us how much we need the cross. <laughs> All right. The good news is you don't have to understand everything I'm saying right now. No, you don't. You don't have to understand all this. Uh, it, first of all, you're not going to get it in one class or two classes or whatever. You're going to get this in a lifetime of walking with the Lord, and you're all walking with the Lord, and you're sure to go there because that's where he's leading you, okay? So it's not important that everybody comprehend every word. You do know that. And, and you don't have to think, oh, my God, if I, I didn't get that. Am I going to go to hell? Or, you know, I don't know what you think, but, you know, whatever fears that come up. Oh, you don't have to worry about that, and I'm not worried about you. Because my intention is, is to get this in such a way that I am dead and that Christ crucified is not my doctrine, but my life, and it filters down by life to the rest of the body. Okay, that's, that's my hope and my goal, and I believe that I have every reason to have faith in that. <laughs> you know, and so I do. So, so I'm not worried. So if you're worried, stop it. Don't make me use force. <laughs> and for those not watching the video, I'm joking. But you'd be surprised. I say stuff off the wall just for fun. We all laugh here, and then people listen to it later and go, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
you think it's not true, folks, I get comments all the time. I hear stuff all the time. You say, well, why do you keep doing that? <laughs> you know, have you, anybody seen the, the little picture on my door back there? Yeah, okay, that's, that's my answer. <clears throat> all right, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me make sure here. We were talking about power in different kinds. There's a power of force by an iron will backed by the resources to enforce that will. There is the power of manipulation either by persuasion or trickery. Somebody want to give me a, a uh, sort of an example of the difference between persuasion and trickery? Mallory? who can find every loophole and make every argument, no matter what side of an argument he argues, he can make it sound so right so that you can be persuaded to go with him. Trickery is you might use a little more strategy in leaving out bits of information or slanting other bits of information to get the desired effect. It might not be quite as honest. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so you could say that persuasion is... Uh, and the, the example Mallory used was like an attorney who can really lay things out and convince you of that. Does this sound anything like that? In my speech, this Paul talking, in my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Uh, there's another place he says this also, but I can't remember. Oh, you know what? I think I just remembered. Um, this is 117, 1 Corinthians 117. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no non effect. Not with wisdom of words. I like that. I like that. I mean, the other one's really good too, enticing words, because, you know, you can present, you can have somebody who just viciously slaughtered and murdered his wife and then have an attorney come in and convince a jury that he really didn't do it. I mean, I'm sure it'll happen one day. But they are very persuasive, folks. All right. But the example Mallory gave, the other one of trickery, is I think that it's got a, a, a form of deception. It's, it's telling you the truth but not the whole truth. You know. And you know what? If God really had the cross for us and someone only told them of Jesus' death there and not that we have died too, isn't that trickery not telling them the whole truth? Nothing but the truth. So help me God. <clears throat> we should make every preacher. I, I swear to tell you. <laughs> but if we did that, I'd be in jail already. Because, you know, I'm still learning. I mean, I am. I'm still learning. And I feel so bad constantly of when I realize that something wasn't complete or whatever. But I have to keep going. I have to keep pressing towards the mark of the prize. And in my pressing, I will grow. And in my growing, I will clarify as I go as much as I have. But, you know, that's why you can't just follow a man. That's why you have to search the scriptures for yourself. Because if you don't, then you're already deceived. Do you know what I mean by that? Because you've, you've refused the, the true line of, of information, which comes from the Holy Spirit. Did I see somebody's hand and fail to? Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, all right. So, so in covering, what we did is we just went through several of these things of wielding power, wielding power. That there are um, there are people who can gain office, political or otherwise, by wielding by having a lot of power uh, by virtue of position or they can have a lot of influence by virtue of money or they could just be a good talker 
trying to think of somebody like that. But anyway, um, you know, and everybody just goes, oh, gosh, that's, that's got to be right, you know, or it sounds so good or whatever. <clears throat> and trickery or persuasion can come in other ways, not just good talkers like an attorney. I mean, you know, pardon? Bribes, yeah. Oh yeah, that's you. You got it, Mike. <laughs> yes, sir. Evil minds work alike. I won't say it. Don't worry. We're safe. Okay. God tends to lean towards the weak. Remember what we read. Uh, when he says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen. I mean, that's just powerful. I mean, this is God's choosing. God chooses to exalt the weak. He chooses to exalt the humble. He chooses them. I choose you. I don't choose you. Can you see that? You know, you think of somebody who exalts itself. I mean, I remember years and years and years, it's been a lot of years ago now, my first confrontation with that scripture that he says that God exalts the humble. And, and uh, I forget the exact wording right now. I think it's in James. But he says, but the, but the hand of the Lord is against him that exalts himself. It's not that, but it's worded similar to that. And the realization came to me, you know, that's not the devil being against me just by lifting up myself or my cause or my ministry or my, you know, we can go on and on and on. You know, let's not, let's, lest we see the true application. <laughs> but, you know, I saw, you know, when I do that, my problem then is with God. Because, you know, I thought, I mean, before that moment, I thought, well, if I raise myself up, I'm getting into pride and the devil's going to get me. You see what I'm saying? And I did. That's how I thought of that. And certainly he probably does, wouldn't you say? But he says, God is against you there. And I thought, man, when you got God and the devil against you, you're in a bad place. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> I don't, you know, that is, that does not sound like what I want, need to be doing in my life, you know. I thought, well, you know, then who is on my side? You know, the Lord said, just you. <laughs> but there are some people who still exalt themselves and say, me on my side is a majority. because they think that highly of themselves, you know. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what God calls power in a more, little more specific way. Uh, again, I apologize, as I said at the beginning of the class, Lord, be merciful to me, a repeater, because I will be repeating a few more times through this, but I think the payoff's going to be worth it, okay? <laughs> We're not dragging our feet. We're actually laying a good enough foundation that when we lay something next on it, it'll stick. And it won't just be another, what was that? What was that? You know. <laughs> I'm sure if I keep attending New Creation Fellowship and Acts Bible School, I'll get it someday. Best thing to do? Run! <laughs> <laughs> All right, <clears throat> Paul has stated that the cross is the power of God. The cross, but the preaching, the, but, but we preach Christ crucified. The power and the wisdom of God. 
And he, sa- and he makes sure that you understand because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He's not talking about the resurrection here. He's talking about the weakness of God. The weakness of God is not seen in the resurrection. Do y'all, uh, y'all agree with that? The weakness of God is seen at the cross. And he says that weakness is the power of God. Notice, uh, I'm just reading here, notice that he does not call the resurrection the power of God. In verses 23 and 24, he also links the wisdom of God with the cross, not just the power of God, but the wisdom of God. And and that's significant, and I don't want to belabor it. I just want to make, I want to make note of it for your sake so that maybe the Holy Spirit will help uh, jog something later on because I think somehow... I think somehow we can sort of shove the power of God into the cross and be okay with that and not change. (coughs) Not, (coughs) excuse me, have any radical um, change in our viewpoint. (coughs) But he says... The cross is the wisdom of God, or the weakness of God is the wisdom of God. You know, that's now that 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 can do some shaking up. You know what I mean? I mean, if you really comprehend that, like I said, it's not. I'm not. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm not trying to. in these classes per se to instruct you or to bring you to some place that I'm at. <clears throat> I probably need to come to some of the places you're at, but um, I'm just trying to lay out carefully what the Spirit is guiding me to <clears throat> lay out, <clears throat> knowing that after this class is over or we leave tonight or the whole course is over, The same guy that was laying out certain things for you will be with you to teach you and to talk and to to make these things way plainer because there'll be life instead of just uh, words right now. All right, so um, God does not want us to conceive of a wisdom or a power apart from Christ crucified. Uh, All right. That's, that's a tough one, because <clears throat> we can say yes to that. But folks, we will resort to another power and another wisdom that is not based on weakness, that is not based on foolishness. We will, because it makes more sense. Wisdom of this world, wisdom of words, Wisdom of the wise, wisdom of this age, wisdom of man. It makes more sense in this realm. It makes absolute sense in this realm. But it's not God. And that kind of wisdom, as we've said before, never reveals God. It doesn't reveal God. I mean, that's, that's a really powerful statement if you think about it. Their wisdom does not reveal God. It reveals the deep darkness of flesh and self. His wisdom, it reveals God. It reveals God. <clears throat> All right. In the cross, Paul sees the greatest explosion of the power of God. All right, well, there's two ways of viewing that, and and we do. We tend to, the the first one and the easy way out is to say, it reveals the power to save. Amen? The power to save. The power, the cross is the power of God, the power to save. Yes. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about that anywhere here. He's not talking about that power, the power to save. He's talking about a power 
Um, well, first of all, let me just address another one that he's sort of talking about, and that is <clears throat> in, uh, in the cross, Paul sees the greatest explosion of the power of God. This is not the full, this is not the big picture. This is a smaller part of that. <clears throat> power over self. Now, Jesus didn't have that. I mean, he, 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 when he became a man, yes, you know, now is my soul trouble, what shall I say then? You know, I mean, there were that, that influence. My soul, he said his soul was troubled. But we for sure have to need a power over self. <clears throat> and that power is seen in two ways. One, the cross that brings about death and Christ crucified, who is not selfish. Does that, does that make sense? Does that sound right? Just more than this side over here? Does that sound right? I mean, is that real? Well, I mean, I'm getting a lot of nice head shakes over here, and I like it. But it's, but I, you know, and it doesn't have to sound right, but I think that that's easily explained. The cross is our death, but even in our death, our soul is an influence did you know that? The old man may not be an influence, but the soul can be an influence, and the very life of Christ, you are saved by his life. <clears throat> All right. That's why we got the Holy Spirit. Thank God I'm not the teacher, but thank God I can believe for you outside of this classroom, too. And I can stand for you because I am... Uh, the pastor that God's raised up here to do that for the sheep. That's my responsibility. <clears throat> All right, so um, so in, in the cross, Paul sees the greatest explosion of the power of God. How much time we got? Z oh, well, you know, y'all need to tell me that. There is no time. There is no power. <laughs> it's all run out, and they're just going to let me keep talking here and and the Skype people are going, look, I need to go to the bathroom. And all right, be dismissed. <laughs>